Right, here we are. And this is the World Sports Chiropractic uh, Chat Show. And my name is Mika. I'm your host again this evening, like every other evening. And, uh, you know, please um, join us again. So welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody equally and uh, without any discrimination to any kind of physical attribute there might be. So we're remaining strictly um, politically correct here at this time. And today I have an absolute treat for you guys. We are joined by none other than Tom Greenway from UK. Tom, Hi, everyone. wonderful to have you on the show. And uh, how are you this evening? Oh, I'm really well. Uh, yeah, very, very good. Thank you. I'm looking forward to having a chat with you, Mika. And uh, it's quite nice to see you without your helmet on and, um, you know, actually looking sort of vaguely, vaguely normal. Normally all I get to see is your backside as you're sort of bombing down some ski slope way ahead of me. <laughs> For those for those who don't know, um, this is a this is a little little thing we have been doing in the UK. So we have the annual ski trip, where a bunch of uh, UK sports chiropractors we get together, and it's organised by either the RCC or the or the BCA now, and uh, these are the associations in the UK, and we go and get some good quality CPD uh, done in the evenings, and the daytime is uh, dedicated to the one and only the most important, skiing, or yeah. snowboarding. Yeah. whichever way you want to slide down a mountain but you know whether it's on the bum shuffling or whatnot we don't judge anybody by that but yeah now we've uh we've been on a couple of trips uh like that together with tom and uh no, it's always an absolute absolute hoot yeah it's good 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 fun but i have to say that mick is very modest but he's an extremely good skier so if you if you, if you end up coming to skiing with us be warned you know you'll have to you have to you have to ski quick to keep up with him <laughs> well there's there's that thing, you know, we, all, we, we, we always want to be sociable, so yes. we don't leave anybody behind and we make yeah. sure that uh, everybody's looked after. So, you know, we go with yeah. the fast group, then we go fast. And if you go with the not so fast group, then um, take your time. No way. Yeah. That's obviously why you drink so much when you're skiing with me. <laughs> Go nice and slowly. Anyway, well, it's all, um, all good. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But hey, you know what? Obviously, most people probably have heard of heard of you Tom you know obviously you've been around uh, around the block a few times when it comes to sports chiropractic in the UK and internationally and uh, obviously you've been to the Olympic Games how many times now is it once or three times how many times I've been I've been yeah quite yeah quite that's a that's a good point I've been yeah quite quite a few times so so my history is basically um, I did uh, my CCSP um, in, in Britain in 1995 and after that um, I applied to go to do the All Africa Games in Zimbabwe um, with Brian Nook and yeah. Brian very bravely said yeah well, why not we'll take Tom the Brit and I think there were about three of us that came from the UK and we ended up in uh, Zimbabwe and um, I mean it was pretty scary because we were basically it with we were the medical service and so we were just doing everything from sort of you know trauma to caro to there were there was a physio team there but it was great fun and um, and that really is what started me on my yeah on my on my journey into sports chiropractic really and then after that we went to um they were doing a pre-olympic training camp in lagrange which is a funny little place to side out of atlanta and that was all being run by fix and uh, we were treating a lot of the athletes from the uh, uh, from the african countries and um just had great fun doing that and um all of the sort of the fix board came down and saw what we were doing and um and we were very nearly going to get access to the Olympics that year, um, which is one of the reasons why the fixed board were there. And then unfortunately, the IOC just pulled the plug just before the games. And um, so we end up, which is, a, which is a little bit frustrating. But for me, the whole experience of being in the Grange, doing a pre-Olympic training camp and everything for uh, two, I don't know, it must have been about two and a half weeks we were out there, was really great. And, and I got a chance to work with all of these chiropractors from around the world and just the techniques you pick up and the different ways of communicating with patients and all of the different sports we were working with was really amazing experience. And I just got a real buzz and an energy for chiropractic that I'd never, that I hadn't really got, yeah, until doing yeah. something like that. We're talking and, about uh, being thrown in the deep end straight from the start, hey? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, but it was, it was, um, yeah, it was really, yeah, uh, it was, um, it was, it was, it was good fun. And then after that, um, I then did the 2000 Olympics, but I went through that with, um, again, with Fix. Fix had a team going out for the, for the and um, through that I did some work with the British team. And, um, and then on the back of that, it, um, I went, was able to work with the British Olympic Association for a while. 
And um, and then I went to Athens in 2004, but that was more, again, that was with the WIA, the World Olympians Association. They had a little thing there and I was um, just went in for a, you know, a few days and did a bit with that. And um, and then 2008, I went in with Roland Noir into Beijing um, for the Beijing Olympics. And we were just doing, again, that was with Fix. And we did a, a trip around looking at all the countries, all the NOCs and um, what they were doing and what they were offering chiropractic wise. And then um, we were able to do a little report to the IOC about that. And that sort of, you know, um, was, you know, quite a useful exercise. Yeah. And then obviously I got seconded into the 2012 games and we provided the chiropractic service then. And um, that was a, that was a good experience. That was the first time chiropractic after the Vancouver games um, was the first time that they had chiropractic in the summer games. Wow. So that was good. And, um, and then um, Rio was a, another interesting um, experience because um, obviously we had chiropractic there and, um, but I didn't really get involved with that. Um, and that was partly because of my, um, a couple of issues with my accreditation and stuff. But, um, and, um, and then we just got to wait and see with, you know, what was going to happen with Tokyo this year, because it was very yeah, easy. Exactly. Yeah. So it would have been interesting to see whether or not they'd got chiropractic over the, you know, got chiropractic involved in those games or not. We, we, we don't know now because of obviously the games have been cancelled. because of the, the, Yeah, the... exactly. And I mean, I know this from behind the scenes that, you know, you've been obviously working hard in liaising with various different, different people all over the place, you know, uh, regarding Tokyo and trying to, trying to push, get us all pushed in there, you know, and doing our thing. Uh, yeah, so... I, think, I think, I think, I think there's an expectation that, you know, I think a lot of the athletes at these major games now, you know, partly with, with what Fix have done, but the world games and what Brian's done with that. And um, certainly um, with the fact that, you know, chiropractic has been on the periphery of the Olympics for a long time and now we're actually um, involved and they want us to be involved. And the feedback from athletes is extremely positive when chiropractors are available. Mm -hmm. And it just makes perfect sense. You know, most countries have got a very limited medical team that they can bring in. Um, yeah. And so they want to access. Um, so often they're not big enough to bring a chiropractor in. Some of them do. But, you know, for the smaller countries, if they can access chiropractic through the polyclinic services and, you know, the services provided at the games, they're going to jump at that. Yeah, because it, oh, it, 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 it takes a, so I, it'd be, it, you know, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm um, optimistic and hopeful that we can, we can keep the, keep it all going. But I think what happens behind the scenes now is really important in terms of um, how, um, how we deliver chiropractic services, you know, at, at smaller games and regional games, yeah, and, 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 all, and how we behave and all that sort of thing is, 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 is part of the part of the challenge. Oh, absolutely, and that's something, of course, that uh, we have in in our um, before recording little chat. You know, we were discussing this to a degree, and and of course, you know, what Fix has been doing over the last little while. So, you know, Simon Lawson, obviously our um, games man, he's he, they, they they those guys have been working hard in trying to make sure that. Um, we get uh, top guys and girls to go to the games and uh, everybody's experienced and everybody knows what they're doing and, and, and that. And, um, and also trying to drum up the volunteers, of course, to turn up for the games because if Fix can't produce a team, then it looks, essentially, it looks pretty bad. So, yeah. of course, that's why we need everybody who might be watching or, or listening, you know, uh, to actually, you know, pull your hand up and, and come and come and join us, you know, come and come and do some games with us and, uh, and, get that experience, the real hands-on, nitty-gritty, in the trenches type of uh, type of thing. And uh, once we have have that rapport, like you know, you say, you know, the athletes want us, you know, the feedback is glowing every time we go. So we do need that because that's leverage. That of course is something that we we need to give Tom and people who work behind the scenes to we, we need to give them the leverage mm -hmm. to actually then make this whole thing happen. Yeah, but I think it's also more on an individual basis. I mean, every time I think, you know, the challenge for you as a person is, is to decide whether or not you're willing to commit time out of your practice, because that, that's ultimately what you're doing. And you may, get, you may get some things paid for, you may not. But the value of what you get from doing that experience is in terms of, you know, and, and I think sometimes it's a big challenge between, well, do you go on holiday or whether do you go and do, yeah, take a week out or a long weekend out to help with athletes. And ultimately you think, well, that's more work. So it's not really a break. But what it does to you mentally and what it does to you in terms of your exposure and experience and what you can turn around and talk to your patients about when you get back right. is really exciting because, you, you know, you get energized in a way, you know, just like going to a really good seminar. And, um, and then it's all adds to your credibility in terms of your CV and your um, and, and just 
and whether you use that to go on and perpetuate your career in fix or in more big international you know things that's fine or you can use that at a more local level and use that as a gate gateway yeah look i've done this this is my experience and this is the gateway into working with a local club or something that works better within your normal practice life so um absolutely yeah, I, I have to say, I have to take you up on that quickly. You know, the um, regarding the sort of the buzz you get and uh, and the exposure and the experience. I mean, obviously you were there. Uh, you, you were saddled with me when I first came when I came to my very first fixed games. Yeah, uh, CSIT games in Riga, 2017. Yeah. And uh, so um, so Tom and I were were teamed up to go to the volleyball arena, and uh, we had a uh, chap from Denmark, Rene. Rene was uh, so we were the team awesome. <laughs> I got that. Yeah. I mean, I think it was a little bit of a little bit of an inferiority complex thing going on because everybody was team this country and that country, and we were just from all over. So, you yeah, know, we just, yeah. it was team awesome then. Yeah. And you know what? That's what it was. It was. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, having yeah. having you uh, you work there on the, on the bench next to me, you know, and and it was it was amazing for me personally. Yeah. Um, you get that kind of well there's tom greenway he's getting his hands dirty you know absolute legend in this in the, in the in the field and and i mean he's not fast he's not flustered you know there might have been 15 people queuing to come and see us you know you just kind of did your thing took your time nice and calm cool as a cucumber and there mm. i was thinking holy hell this is hard work <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean that's but it, but that's what I'm that's that's what I think is the magic yeah. of you know the sports chiropractic and fix is exactly that. And then you go and then when you finish a hard day, you've got really happy athletes. You know you've done a really good job, and then you just chill out with with with, with, with some guys and have some food and you know it, it's 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 and, you know and they're from all over the world and you've got that. You, and the one thing we've all got in common is, is we're all chiropractors. You know, and so you can you can talk shop or not as the case may be, and everybody gets it and. You know, and it is a very, very special environment that, and I don't, I don't, I can't think of any other aspect to chiropractic that allows you that opportunity to really sort of hang out with, 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 you know, with chiropractors from all over the world, with lots of different diversity in, in terms of how they practice and, and you bring it all together. You know, it, it's really, it's a, it's a, it's a very, yeah, it's a cool, it's a really cool thing. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, like, you know, coming back, I remember I, um, I, uh, I obviously flew back to back to back to London, you know, from from Latvia, and uh, I had to take a taxi and uh, taxi home. And then my wife calls me in the middle of it, goes, "Oh, mm. we're not home. We're at um, somebody's house. So come there, come directly there." Mm. So I'm just giving the taxi driver different instructions and not paying attention half the time. But I turn up at our friend's house, and I'm I'm just like incoherent. I'm just like babbling about things and you know trying to explain to everybody what I've been up to and how cool yeah. it was. They all look at it going, no idea. <laughs> 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 you know, it's that kind of they 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 do this gobsmacked. You know, so you did what? You went on a labor camp for the last five days, and you paid. You know, you lost income and this and that, and you're happy about it. Mm. <laughs> exactly, but I mean, but I I just think the way it makes you grow, yeah, emotionally and. Um, and clinically, it's just it's it, it's a it's a phenomenal opportunity you know, to, to sort of do that sort of stuff. Really, really, I, 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 and and then and also the friends you make, you know, in, oh, you know absolutely. Like, over the years and everything else, and um, and they're from all over the world, and you know all of that sort of thing. And another, that's one of the the greatest things for me is that I've got you know good buddies now, you know, all over the world, and you, you know, and they and they go, oh, I'm coming through London, Tom, you around, and you know, or, you know, we can catch up and. Um, chew the fat and all that sort of thing and I, I just think you know that that's one of the for me I think the most rewarding things is even though I'm sort of coming to, I feel very much I'm coming towards the end of my time now in in in, in, in sports car to a certain extent but all of those contacts I've got around the world and you never know when you're going to bump into them or which games you're going to see them at again but it's just that natural you know feel for for, for getting together it's just very special it really is well, absolutely right and you know the it's, it's also the sort of, um, I mean, like you said about the camaraderie and that, you know, and I mean, being a chiropractor, if you're just stuck in a room, you know, in your clinic, uh, you don't really socialize with other chiropractors. Maybe there's not one close to you and uh, maybe you kind of lost touch with your, your university buddies or something like that. You know, life happens, doesn't it? So it can be actually a really lonely place. Yeah, exactly. Because I mean, I you, can't really, 
you can't really talk to your patients exactly like you would talk to a colleague, you know, because they don't get it. No. Well, I, just, I, often, I often describe this as, you know, I think the problem with practice life is it's like being in a goldfish bowl. You know, you spend mm. your whole time, or a fish tank, you know, you spend your whole time looking at the other fish and you swim around and you know exactly what that, what that fish tank is like, you know, how big it is, you know, where the rocks are, you know, that's the thing. And yeah, sometimes they may throw in a different fish, but it, ultimately it's the same environment. And then as yeah. soon as you go and do a games or you go and do one of these, you know, you go and work with a different sport, suddenly you start to realise you're in a bit of a lake and then suddenly you realise actually... I'm in the sea and yeah. that and that exposure is just the way it makes you grow and you see a bigger picture and you start to see a lot more yeah I think you get a much better idea of where chiropractic fits in yeah into the healthcare environment rather than just a, a, a sort of a more small blanket view on you know um, a perspective of what, what of survival and how you're going to get to the next day and pay the bills and all of that sort of thing no um, absolutely right yeah. yeah, no, it really does open up the horizons when, uh, and especially, you know, if you, if you are fortunate enough to, um, to get into this kind of early in your career, I yeah. think you'll know, have a very different outlook for your, your whole career. Yeah. Rather than if you wait for, for, you know, 10, 15 years, you pay for your weddings and houses and this and that. And, and then you think, okay, now I'm, um, you know, my mid forties, now I can step out a little bit, but actually, you know, you kind of missed out. Yeah. And I think the thing is, is, you know, if you think about, you know, the average practice life is 40 years. So, you know, do you want to spend 40 years in the same office doing the same thing? Or how do you want to break that up? How do you want to make that interesting? And, you know, when I look at my, th I mean, I've been in practice 30 years. So I've got 10 more years to go. And of that 30, the vast majority has been involved in sport, but at different levels and different ways and all of that sort of thing. And, you know, when I look back at the highlights of all, of, all the highlights of my aspect in practice, you know, I mean, I think right at the beginning, the first year or two, it's, you know, getting a really good adjustment or getting the, that patient better, you know, that you weren't expecting to get better. And you suddenly get that confidence that actually you really can make a difference and you can really change people's lives. But then after that, that becomes much more of the norm. And then you start worrying about the patients who aren't getting better or the ones who aren't quite doing as well as they should be. And so that becomes more of a negative, potentially a more negative experience. So um, if you then leave in the office and you're going to go do something else, which is a bit more dynamic and introduces you to different people, it grows your practice, it grows your contact base, but it also gives you, it makes you feel really, um, really excited about going to work. Well, it does me anyway. I mean, I'm still. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree. I yeah. completely agree. Yeah. And there's that element when you, when you, when you're talking to even your normal Mrs. Smith who comes in with uh, a bit of low back pain or whatever it may be, you know, when, and you know you can slip all of that stuff in the conversations, and <laughs> and it, it you know it allows a very different dynamic almost in the treatment room, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And, and, and I think the other problem we have as chiropractors is, is that we don't really have a quality standard. You know, it's like what makes Micker a great chiropractor? You know, and the thing is, well, because he is, he's looked after me for years, he's looked after my family. But then if you turn around and go, well, actually, he's very involved in elite sport, and he goes and does this, and immediately you have a you have something that your patients can sell you by, yeah? Because there's an yeah, yeah. external body that says he's really good at what he does, and that's why he's working in that environment. And I think that, for me, at the beginning was, you know, I worked in a, in a big practice. I was, I had to find my own niche, yeah, within there was, oh, there were five chiropractors working there. I thought, the only way I'm going to survive here is if I've got my own identity within the, within the team. And I thought very quickly, sports the way that I want to do that. You know, I like sports, and you know, and um, and um, yeah, and that was, and that very quickly worked. Because people, you know, my patient would go, I go and see him because he's the one that does this, yeah, and yeah. the other can do that, and um, so um, and that's why even if it, even if you know it, you, you think to yourself, oh, it's a fairly minor thing, or it's the local hockey team, or it's something that is, doesn't seem like a big deal, it is because it's something that sells you, yeah, yeah, and um, your patients have got another thing to say positively about you, and also you know it's a big de big deal for them, yeah, exactly, that's exactly it. Because you're making a difference in the life of that hockey team. You're making the difference in the life of that athlete who may have been niggled, riddled by some chronic injuries and, uh, you know, never got it managed, never got it sorted. And you go in there and, and, and you know, uh, whip out your stuff and, and, and essentially um, sort out the problem. So this athlete may now have extra five years added to their career. That's exactly it. And, and that is the wonderful thing about chiropractic. It is one, our results are instantaneous, yeah, which no one else can do. And the thing is, is you know, and a number of athletes that say to me, I mean, I remember when I was working at one of the football teams, the manager turned around to me and said, I want you to go to, um, I want you to go and check out AC Milan. 
And I said, why? And he said, because they keep the old players going longer than anybody else. And I want to understand why and how they do it. So, of course, I go to AC Milan. Who's it head up by? You know, Jean-Pierre Mieserman. Who's Mieserman? He's a chiropractor. Yep. And so that's it. You know, so, and uh, he uses the wellness model. And um, so I go back, I write a report, and I present that to the team. This is, you know, if you want to keep the older players going longer, this is what you need. And the chiropractic is an essential part of all of that. And the manager's got it. And ever since every every club he's been to since then, he has now has a chiropractor on the on, on, on the team because he knows that actually we're better at keeping those older patients going longer than anybody else. And that's why and that's why athletes love us because we produce things really quickly. You know, if you've got a hundred meter sprinter and he's there and he's at the world championships and that's the thing, what are they gonna want just before they go on the track? They want to be adjusted. That's it. They don't want anything else, they want to be adjusted. Maybe a bit of homeopathy. <laughs> Well, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna poo poo that at all if you know no, no, I don't feel like that, you know. <laughs> you know what? The cool thing is that it works for people. Yeah. It works exactly. for everybody. Yeah. So what? It doesn't matter. But the point is, yeah, it doesn't produce an instantaneous result. <laughs> that was kind of the angle I was going for there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know what? Yeah, like you said, you know, it it is nigh on magic, isn't it? And, and, yeah. Those athletes are so super appreciative, which yeah. of course adds to your sort of, you know, it's always that little, you know, well done, lad, you know, when, when somebody actually um, uh, comes to see, you know, the hobbling and, 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 and you go, right, okay, you, you're okay, you're not going to die, get off the bench, let this person on the bench now, <laughs> I'll, I'll be back with you in a minute, you know, and then you deal with this person, and they go back and win a medal or something, and they come back and say, you know, awesome, you know, that was, uh, you know, you managed to help me out with this one. Yeah. Uh, I think the, yeah, yeah, and I, and I think I think also actually, when I look back on it, I think it's also about my own ego to a certain extent. Because the thing is, if you if you if you're good at what you do, and um, athletes are going to tell you whether you're actually going to be good at what you do, more so than anybody else, because they're they're absolutely totally reliant on their own performance. And if you do something that helps them with their performance, or they genuinely feel that you made a difference in returning them to training more quickly, then mm -hmm. they're going to really and they're going to tell you that, and they're going to go, yeah, you're really good at what you do. And they're going to come back and see you, and they're going to send everybody else in to come back and see you. Oh, that's right. And it's and it's a um, and it's I think if you want a bit of an ego trip, and you, or you want to test whether I, am I really as good as I want, I think I am. Yeah. <laughs> go just get oh, going. Well, click athletes, definitely. And the other thing, you know, like you mentioned uh, AC Milan, I think there was a big thing. I recall um, Jean Pierre came and uh, he popped into AECC back in the day when I was studying and gave us a lecture about all this stuff they were doing. I can't remember all of it now, but. Yeah. Obviously, there was that big thing on on prehab, you yeah, know, preventing any kind of uh, mishaps and things like that, and uh, sorting those things out, and and also you know the performance enhancement side of things, which is um, phenomenally important. Yeah, so it's not only about acute injuries, but I, it's actually trying to make sure that this person is near enough hundred uh, percent as as much of the time as possible. Yeah. No, I think, and I think, I mean, I think it's all, I mean, you know, I, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years and I think, you know, and actually some of the stuff that chiropractic, you know, I mean, like what Jean-Pierre was doing there was he was assessing athletes at the beginning of the season just to see where they were at. Yeah. And the idea behind that was if they got injured, can we get them back to where they were pre-season? And, and the, being pre-season was the optimum of where they should be. But the reality of the situation is, is that actually if they get injured, you want to get them beyond where they were pre-season because pre-season yeah. they're not necessarily the best they were. But that whole assessment and analysing where they are, where they are with injury, what you assess and all of that sort of thing has now gone full circle. And of course, it's part of, you know, performance optimization. It's part of reducing injury risk and injury strategies. And all of that's being adopted now by the IOC and that's going across. And there's much more conversation now about how do we prevent hamstring injuries? How do we, you know, reduce the risk of back pain and all of that sort of stuff. And that's all really. And, and I think Cairo fits really nicely into all of that. And I think... One of the things we should be doing is, is if you are working with a team, all of that data you should be keeping. Because if we compare the injury recovery rates of teams with chiropractor without a chiropractor, and it's all pretty standardized now, certainly within across the premiership um, in football and in rugby, all of that information is pretty standard. And you can look and you can start just doing data analysis and proving that teams with chiropractors it has this effect on outcomes yeah. and or prevention. And, um, and we just start producing papers on that. It's not difficult to do that. We don't need to do any research as such. We just need to keep the data. But well, it's you haven't got anything going on at the moment. So do you want to take that up? 
<laughs> oh, I'm, I'm thinking that it would be, um, you know, I think it's definitely something uh, we just need to coordinate. I mean, the trouble is, is every, every National Chiropractic uh, Sports Council have to start coordinating which chiropractors are working where and then yeah. getting them to talk to each other. Um, and, um, and that just requires a little bit of logistics and a little bit of getting people, you know, getting people together. Um, but yeah, I think we should. I think we should do that. The trouble is, is that we're all busy people, yeah. And so you end up doing your thing, and you know you've got to write, 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 worry about running your practice, and you've got your commitment to your other bits and pieces, and all that sort of thing. So actually, you know, you need somebody more strategic outside of all of that to actually put put you all together. Because you know, chiropractors love getting together, and if it's all done for them, then they'll do it. But they need yeah, all yeah. that. They need all that to happen because it's um, it's it's a lot of work otherwise. No, oh, absolutely. Yeah. But as I get, as I as I as I start doing less actual hands-on chiropractic, I'm definitely going to be doing more of that sort of stuff because I think it is important. Oh, absolutely, it's, it is, and you know, like obviously, Fix itself has, of course, evolved over the last couple of years. Where I would, uh, without without being sort of overly critical of, of the pre uh, people who were in charge previously, but now we're looking at a, a lot more professional, professionally run organization. Yeah. You know, so we're a lot more dynamic. People are actually talking to each other. You know, which yeah. is great, and uh, you know a lot of these decisions take place, and 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 things are things are pushed through improvements and and changes in policy, etc. It happens within more like more like uh, days rather yeah. than waiting for the next quarterly meeting. You know, eight weeks time. So, yeah. you know, so we are we are moving with the times. We are rolling with uh, with all of this, and and yeah. we're getting better. So yeah. you know, that's something that, of course, I think we are we're definitely going in the right direction. And of course, yeah. you know. Um, when we when we find stellar volunteers, obviously like yourself, you know, I think we just hire, you know, we just earmark a job for you, Tom. There. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd be really happy to do something like that because I mean, it's just, you know, I think you just talk to the institutions, you know, because they're all very interested in sport and they've got lots of students there that are doing on to do their masters and a lot of them have to do their own dissertations, you know, as part of their you know their final program. And um, I don't, I don't, it, it, it's not difficult. It's just a question of just plugging them into the right people. And, and the right contacts and um you know and then um you know um because i think you know data is very i mean i mean i certainly found like at the olympics we i had access to all of the data of what chiropractic actually did during the olympics during the games real time and and real comparisons between what Cairo did what osteo did and what sports massage did and what physio did and the actual utilization per chiropractor and per osteopath was far in a way higher than with the physios even though there were a lot more physios so they had a lot more encounters in actual percentage terms so they everybody now knows so every time i'm asked just is chiropractic needed in these games you just show them the data this is the real time data and that's the thing it's a it's a complete you know, there's no arguments once you once you show people what, what 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 we can do and how well we utilize in these sort of environments that's right yeah yeah. So obviously, um, I, was this in from from the Rio games? No, this well, we got we got the data from the Rio games wasn't as good as it was from London. London 2012, we got some really good, and we did these big reports, you know, to the IOC just yeah. about the utilization of. Um, so they now so so they call it the COPS service, which is chiropractic, osteopathy, uh, sports massage, and physio. And they all work under the same umbrella because before it was just physiotherapy. So now we have, and so now we keep going when we're having discussions about if you're going to run a games, are you going to run it as a COPS games, as in they're going to provide all of those services, or is it just going to be a physio games? Yeah. And um, so, and at the moment, the Commonwealth games tend to be just a physio and massage games. Um, mm. But we're hoping they'll, they'll turn it into a COPS games. Yeah, no, that'd be amazing. Which would be really amazing. amazing. Yeah. And that's obviously something that uh, will will massively raise the profile of again, you know, for for sports chiropractic and for fixed as well. And uh, yeah. of course, then feed yeah. into further and further opportunities coming through. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, fixed have done a great job with all the South Am you know, the South American games and uh, the Pan Am games and all of those, the Caribbean games and all of those sort of things, which is part of the you know as as right with, with the World Games and all of these games. Are really, really strategically important, like you know, like with the European Olympics. Um, mm. I don't know do we have, anyway, I was involved with that one, but um, again, that's another you know, really high profile event. It may be a regional games, but it's massive for those regions. And if those athletes are used to accessing chiropractors at those, at, at those games, 
then they're going to be asking for those services, you know, through their federations, they're going to be asking for that, they're going to be expecting that at the Olympics, and all of that momentum just builds, yeah, in terms of negotiating our involvement um, further down the line. But we still, we still, we're still not there yet. We've still got to, we've still got a lot of work to do. We still need to make sure that we really were actively work at getting ourselves involved with these federations and within all of these things. And if we do that, then um, yeah, I think there, there'll be enough momentum. So we'll just be part of the, the contract. So that's if cool. you're hosting these games, chiropractic should be included in those games. And that's what we've got to aim for. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, then, yeah, and then Fix is in a really good position to provide all those, those people, you know, because you've got, You've got the training, you've got the postgraduate training, you've got the levels of what people want and what they need. And you can turn around and go, right, well, this is a level three games or this is a level four games. Or, and you can turn around and go, right, well, these are the level three applicants we've got, you know, from around the world. And then you just select those people. It, it'll be, exactly. it's, a, it's a really good, really, we're very lucky because most of the other federations like physio and osteopaths and the massage therapists, they don't have World Federation like the FIX. All oh, right. Yeah. Oh, I knew that. No, the osteopaths, um, after the Rio games, they, they set one up, yeah, but it's really basically a British, a British based, you know, um, kind of thing, but it's not really, I mean, the oste there's a lot more division within, or diversity within osteopathy than there is within chiropractic, okay. and so it's, it's quite challenging for them to, to be able to do as we do, um, but um, yeah, sports massage, and um, there is a World Federation Physiotherapy, but it's very, it's not really as, as, as it's not as encompassing or as, I mean, or as organized actually as fix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. you're making fix sound really good there, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you always, you know, I mean, the thing is you're always going to criticize, yeah, any organization. Yeah, of course. But actually the structure of fix and what it's trying to do and everything else is actually very good. Mm -hmm. And it does give us a, I mean, that was why I was involved with fix for a long time was because I really do believe that we need an international federation. You know, we do need international standards in education. Mm -hmm. And it's, and it's a very easy drum for me to bang when I'm talking to people about, you know, yeah, we've got fixed, they're really good. You know, they were involved with Gates and, you know, and all of that sort of thing. And uh, so it's not called Gates anymore, it's something else, isn't it? You know, where, you know, still, still alive, yeah. Yeah, it's still Gates, is it? It's still yeah, called Yeah, as far as I know, yeah. That's yeah, right. the General Assembly of Sports and International Federations or whatever it is. You know what? They, they, you know, like in all the, all the emails that I, I get CC'd or copied in, you know, I, yeah. There's all these weird acronyms. They're about 17 letters long, and I haven't got the faintest idea. Oh, yeah, what yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, it's no, kind no, of not no. the one. Yeah, 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 yeah. It sounds good. <laughs> well, it's a bit like the um, ICSSD program. That seems to get longer and <laughs> changes every time that I, I get any correspondence from Fix. Oh, so. no, but see, that's, that's new now. Now it's ICSC. They, oh, oh, so they've, they've made it smaller again now. Yeah, so now it's gone gone, gone back. Uh, no, 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 good. Oh, I'm quite glad. Yeah, because you know, I, I've still got my CCSP, so I'm quite glad that it's gone back to four, four things. Yeah, so you know, you're you're going to be in a wee bit of trouble there, Tom. You got to do the you got to do the head injury module to um to get your get your ICSC because that's the oh. requirement now. So you can't actually go to games without an ICSC. All oh, right. Okay. Well, I will. I, I, but I hear the head injury model is worth doing, and it's very good. It was actually, yeah. I I, I went through that um sort of uh, I think it was last summer already. And yeah. It was actually it was really well put together. You know, yeah. there I saw, but you know, it was yeah. really well put together. We had uh, there's good presenters there who obviously take you through the different nuances about um, concussions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and uh, you know, even even to. Uh, to dental trauma and ear lacerations, all this kind of stuff, which is, you know, oh, good. It, it happens. Yeah. And, um, you know, of course, we hope, hopefully, we don't have to deal with blood injuries too much because that gets a bit gruesome. Yeah. But, um, you know, at least you won't panic when you, when you, when you, when you throw in the deep end. <laughs> well, I think, I think, I, and I, I do think that's one thing that we, we, we do need to really be quite aware of is, is, you know, I think a trauma certificate. <laughs> Or as they probably call it that, that in the UK, I know it's called different things around the world. Mm. I think if you're going to do games, you know, where there is, you know, and you are going to be a primary contact physician at those games, because we don't have that sort of exposure in clinic at all, you know, about oh. injuries oh. and lacerations and, you know, big contusions and all that sort of thing. I think that's something that we need to be really, if you're going to start to do more of these games and we're going to be in that role, then I think we need to we need to have that as a sort of minimum certification, you know, part of the part of the part of the thing. And it may well be that the ICSS or the CCSP or the ICSS ICSC program has changed now, so that, that that's all in there. But um, I think that um, certainly that's that's going to be a 
mandatory requirement if you're going to be involved in one of the big games like that you're going to have to have a trauma certificate otherwise you're not going to be able to do them i think that's a great idea i yeah. think that's a great idea and i'll definitely uh mention that to christine when when i speak to her next you know i'll uh i'll uh i'll just throw in cheeky in you know so how are you getting on with that trauma certificate you know <laughs> Well, really? I think, you know, if it's like, I mean, you know, like, you know, the ICSS model, um, you have the modules, the hands-on modules, I think you do two or three of those. And I think it would be quite good if one of those, mod, you know, if there's another module, which is just a weekend of doing trauma, and you just get someone like a paramedic in, or you get, uh, you know, uh, uh, and there's loads of them around that do it, you know, and you just, yeah. and you just turn around and go, right, okay, we, we want this level of certification, and then you get a certificate that guarantees that, so that if you are applying for, like the CSIT games or you're doing the world games or and you are going to be the chiropractor at taekwondo for example and there isn't really anybody else there that is the the the, the trauma doc yeah then you, right, you, know, yeah. you can feel you you feel and you've also got enough in your toolbox as in your medical bag yeah to make sure that you can actually service those injuries appropriately and that's all the right, other yeah. pieces yeah no absolutely so, right yeah. oh there you are but um hold on i had a point i was going to make there about something or the other. It's completely slipping my mind now. Okay. What were we talking about just now? We we're talking about the certification and all that. Yeah. And yeah, so the ICSC. Yeah, so that's obviously been revamped completely now. Yeah. It's really quite exciting, you know, and now there's uh, so the, all the material has been has been completely done again. So the, the yeah. fixed team has been on it. Uh, the squirreling away there in, a, in their different corners of the world. And, yeah, uh, they put together a heck of a heck of a program. And the mo and the module and the modules is it still two modules that you do now, or is it three modules well, that you do? Oh, well, the hands-on seminars are two. Yeah, they're two. But the actual actual online learning portion has been completely done as well, redone as well. Yeah, so, yeah. So they incorporated all the latest research in there, and it's it looks really banging. good. And are you assessed? As you do the modules, is it like a is it like a continual learning thing, or is it you do an exam at the end to get your thing? Ooh, uh, I have yeah. Hold on, how does it go? So I think you do the quizzes as you go. Yeah. If I'm, don't anyone quote me on this, but I think there's a big exam at the end. Uh, there is a big exam at the end. I seem to recall. Well, at least there was when I did my ICSSD yeah. and yeah. then converted. So yeah, yeah, there definitely was. Okay, cool. All right, good. I mean, you know, I think that's great because if you've got that and you've got a minimum standard of competency, yeah, which is internationally recognised, and that's, uh, right. that's a really, really, you know, really, really good, yeah, good position. Yeah. yeah, and that's something hopefully, you know, like um, like you said about the different levels, you know, whether it's a bronze or a silver or a gold standard, you know, whatever it may be. Yeah. You know, I think there's there's some uh, some rumours that there might be another another level coming up after the ICSC, which yeah. would be really quite interesting. Yeah, um, and that's probably going to involve then. Uh, you know, well, a lot more advanced stuff again. Yeah. I'd be, I'd be, I'd be a person looking forward to do uh, undertaking that as soon as. Yeah, because I think, I think, I think, I think, you know, these sort of these courses is all. It's all about giving you the confidence to go out there and do be a chiropractor. You know, in sport, because I think sometimes you know people just need a little bit of a. I mean, I think most, you know, some people are, are you know, got a, a blase enough or they're confident enough just to go out there and do it anyway. But I think for a lot, I mean, for me, I felt when I came out of university, I felt, you know, very secure about, you know, certain aspects to what I could do. Yeah, and I felt really competent in clinic. But, you know, you give me a knee or you give me an ankle or you know, I wasn't nearly as competent at looking at those as I was at other things. Mm. And, um, and I felt like after I'd done the fixed program, then I was really confident to do knees. And, and, I, and, I, and I was good with the anatomy, good with the terminology, good with the testing, yeah, and all that sort of thing. So if I ended up in an environment where I was talking to a physio or a, MD or whatever, then you know, I would. It was all there, yeah. So I could tell my God, this is definitely, um, and all of those sorts of things. Because you don't want to look a prat, you know. If you're, you know, you're not using the right terminology when you're talking to these people, because, you know, I think there's an element of understanding that you know we have different educational streams, and so your your terminology and your language may be different, but you've still got to be able to talk across the line in terms of what you think is going on and and explain that in a way that people understand. Oh, um, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, of course, that makes you a team player a lot more as well. And that's yeah. something that has, has come up with, uh, with a few few different people I've had a chat with, you know, recently. And, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of the importance of the communication. Yeah. And, I mean, one thing I found actually was quite useful. I, I completed the FIFA football medicine course uh, yeah. in the summer. Yeah. Uh, well, not summer, spring. 
Yeah. And, um, since I had nothing else to do because the whole Corona malarkey and uh, so I had a bit of time in my hands. I thought, well, let's plow through it. Yeah. You know what the biggest take home thing I thought was that um, it taught me their terminology. Yeah, exactly. It was written by sports medicine people, yeah. uh, for sports medicine people. And there are me as a chiropractor reading and I thought, well, you know, okay, it doesn't feature chiropractic. It, it doesn't feature my expertise, no. but you know, at least now I know what, how they think. And I know exactly. what they call things. Exactly. And, and then that means that, you know, if you now, you know, go and talk to a, you know, a sports club or whatever, and they're interviewing you, you know exactly the terminology to use. Yeah. And you're going to be able to talk and communicate in a way that's going to make you seem like you're interdisciplinary. You understand that where, that, that, that where they're going to, you're going to suddenly become, yeah, you, he's a team player. I understand how, where he's coming from. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. So those kind of, all these kind of things are quite useful. And, and I suppose that's been, that's been really, if you, if you want to look for an upside in this whole Corona uh, thing, you know, that's happened, you know, is that I think a lot of our colleagues have actually spent the time wisely and they have furthered their education and knowledge and, and taking seminars and courses, you know, online. Uh, yeah, quite definitely. Yeah. Because nowadays, it's so easy. Yeah, because you know, nowadays, it's so easy because you can access it all on the computer and off you go. You know, it's not, it's really not, uh, it's really not difficult, but I, would, I think it's really, really good use of your time doing that sort of thing. No, absolutely right. Absolutely yeah. right. But um, do you know what? I don't think I actually ever asked you, but what got you into chiropractic in the first place? It was actually my my cousin. He was a um, he was a he was a um, he, his best friend was a chiro was, was was trained to be a chiropractor. Okay. And, um, and so that was why I thought right that's um, that 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 seems like a good profession for me to try. Yeah, I always wanted to do something in the medical profession that sort of thing. But that was so I sort of I, I came to it a roundabout way rather than being a chiropractic patient since I was five and yeah and all of that kind of thing. It was. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it, was, it was sort of one of those, you know, one of those things. So, yeah, never looked back though. I, did, I didn't really enjoy AECC at all, yeah, where I went through. I was too young. I wish I'd had, um, I wish I'd had a bit more time out, yeah, and um, yeah. gone slightly more mature. I found that, you know, being a very, um, I think, you know, it's quite full on having to look after people. And that's the thing when you're going through, when you're young, going through, um, um, but, when I was, as soon as I got into practice, I knew that I was, I'd found my thing. You know, I, I love being a chiropractor, and I, you know, and um, that's the thing I enjoy most, really. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. You know, like uh, I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head there. You know, in terms of the maturity, because yeah. after college, I mean, I remember when I qualified. I mean, I was uh, what was I, twenty six, <clears throat> like that. And you know, I, I, I mean, come on, all my patients were older than me. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. There I was, you know, clean shaven and trying to trying to have muster some kind of um, authority to tell yeah. them what to do. And yeah. It didn't go down really, you know, all that well. I have to yeah. say, half the time. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, um, it, yeah, exactly. It is all that stuff, isn't it? It's, you know how you communicate, and you know, and, you know, if, if you, you know, I don't think you really find yourself till you're 25, 26 anyway. Yeah. And um, and then I think you know, so if you if you're trying to deal with you know, all of that stuff before then, it's quite, it's quite tough. You know, I think yeah, it's absolutely. Just, yeah. I recall a couple of my, my course mates, they qualified at age 23. Yeah. Of course, you know, you think, come on, man. You yeah. know, that is, uh, that is, is a bit young. Yeah. I don't, don't mean to be derogatory about it, but it's something that uh, you haven't really mustered that sort of life experience to actually then have a, you know, carry a good conversation with people about most things. Yeah, exactly. But again, you know, all these young, young, young guns who are coming through, you know, come to the games, come join, come in, uh, join in the fun with Fix, and, you know, all of a sudden you have a lot more meaningful things to talk about, you know. <laughs> uh, yeah, and that's exactly what happened to me, you know, I found, and I, and I found, you know, kindred spirits and chiropractors that I was, you know, doing all this stuff with were, you know, similar mindset to me, and, um, yeah, it was, it, it, it's, I've, had so, I've had so much fun, and you get to do some really cool things, you know, it's like, you go to opening and closing ceremony of Olympic Games, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, Premier League, Champions, Champions League finals, you know, stuff like that. And actually to be there and be part of it all is, 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 uh, is, 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 is an amazing experience. And I think, you know, the thing for me is, is that you know, when you do something really big like the Olympics and it's a four year program, you realise that every single person who's there is there because they've been selected to be there. 
yeah. and they've all had to carry on their different bits of excellence to get there. So whether you win a medal or whether you don't, the fact you've got there is yeah. exactly what it's all about. That's right. And, um, you know, whether it be the World Games or whether it be the Pan Am Games or whatever, for those athletes and, and the medics and the, you, the chiropractors, everybody that is there, it's, it's, it's the highlight of your career because it, all yeah. of that work you've done has got you to that position. And, um, and that's something that you'll always be proud of. I mean, you may, not, you may not do the best job there or you may make some mistakes or you may do whatever, but that's not the point. What your memory will be is, is you know, I worked really hard to achieve this. I've now done it. I've been there and done that. Thank you very much. And, um, and everyone is, every one of those moments is a unique experience. Oh, um, absolutely right. And that's what makes up your life. You know, it's all these little memories, you know, of what you've achieved, you know, and whether you do a very quick, you know, whether you, whether you do one triathlon or whether you do six triathlons, each one of those is, you know, the first one's an achievement. Yeah. The second one was, oh, the swim was awesome. Yeah. The, the next one is, oh, the run was, was horrendous. It was in the yeah. rain. I lost my, do you know what I mean? You've got a story to tell about each one of those things. And I think every oh, single game I've done has been a completely unique experience. And then you look back and that's what builds up your life your clinical life but right. right. tell me tell me a cool story you know what kind of or, or story of potentially adventure or misadventure or, or what must that happen okay. in, uh, I, 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 okay. right. so I, I, I like on this one i'll tell you three stories okay they're all about similar athletes but with all very different presentations all right go on the first one i had um with this athlete was at the um was it was at the all africa games she was a namibian swimmer and she came in and she'd just done her, she had just done a warm up. It was just before the final. And um, she came in and she just said, I, I, I've locked up my, my shoulder. So I had a look at her and she was in tears. Yeah. Cause she said, I've just, I, I can't not, I can't swim. Yeah. So you, I do, whatever, whatever you do, you, 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 you got to help me. Mm. So anyway, thankfully it was just a rib. Yeah. So I just put her on the couch. She had to do the boom, popped a rib and everything. I said, right, go swim. Yeah. You know, I've done what I can. I think, I think you're going to be okay. And then she came back and it, she was in tears and I went, oh, is it that bad? And she went, no, I just won the bronze. And I didn't think I was going to get into the, I didn't think I was going to get into the top 10. Okay. So that for me was a, and then she was on the phone to her parents saying, you've got to talk to this guy. He was the one that got me to, into the final. Yeah. And he, he was the reason I got the medal because I, I didn't think it was going to happen and all that sort of thing. So that was a, you know, that was an amazing, amazing moment for me. So then you move on about 15 years. Okay. And the second one, was a um, was an archer that came in, another female that came in, and um, she um, basically um, had a rib problem, you know, or, you know, or, or a shoulder problem on her right shoulder, which was her main. She was an archer, was on on, mm. on, on that side, and um, she said, um, you know, uh, it's really annoying me so much that I'm I'm not able to concentrate on my yeah on what I'm doing. Mm. So I just you know, went through and I said, yeah, we'll just loosen up the, uh, the shoulder blade. We can loosen up your mid-back a little bit. And I'm sure that'll make a difference. And then she went, but what's that going to do to my muscle memory? And I went, you what? And she said, my well, muscle memory, I've spent four years training, yeah, to be an archer. So it's all about skill. It's all about holding the art, you know, the, the, the bow in the right position. If you start messing about with my shoulder, how, that's going to affect my muscle balance. And that's what I've been working on for the last four years. So I suddenly went, holy moly, I've never worked with an archer before. I've got no idea. So <laughs> if I go in there and actually start to really adjust her like I would do, yeah, normally, that's going to completely, that could completely change her rhomboid firing pattern. It could change the upper traps and scalings were a little bit tight. How much of that is, and I've never, never worked with her before. And all the other things. So I had to suddenly stop and go, right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to do a very little bit. So I thought I'd just, just do a little bit of muscle release first. Right, go away. And the great thing about games is, is that you've got loads of time. So yeah. I said, we'll do a little bit. Go and do your warm-up as you would do normally. See how you feel, and then come back and tell me whether that was enough. And then so she came back. And I ended up, we built, built I mean, you know, and I didn't, I'm not sure I even I, it really adjusted a rib in the end. But we just went through loads of different things do some things up, take to, tried lots of different things, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And then in the end, she did really well. And what really, what I was really chuffed about with that athlete was at the end of it all, she didn't win a medal, but she did really well. You know, she very, I think she got fourth or fifth. And, um, but for her, the fact that she was in the competition, she ended up in the top 10 in the world, which was a big deal for her. And she, and she knitted this little beer mat thing, you know, out of, you know, like, like, like a, 
And it obviously took her hours to do this. So obviously she was doing this as well as, you know, training. And then yeah. she gave it to me at the end as a, as a thank you. Oh, wow. And I thought, wow, that was a, that was oh, a, neat. that was a, that was a neat, neat. So then there was an, a, another, another one. And, um, and this was more of a, a more tricky one. And um, it was a rower. And um, she was a more of a mature athlete, yeah, rather than a younger one. Mm. And, um, and she had been, um, she had developed mid back pain again, and um, it was all, you know, a little bit sore and that sort of thing. Anyway, to cut a long story short, she'd been, she had been pretty much over treated, and, um, and the reason she wasn't getting better was because she had a stress fracture through one of her ribs, and um, and so, and that was the reason why she wasn't really getting better. And we had to go through this, you know, quite complex process, yeah, of working out. Because I just, you know, I always get suspicious when an athlete comes in and they've been treated by a good therapist and they're going, but it's no better. And you're yeah. thinking, well, it's just a normal, if you're a rower and it's a normal mid-rib, yeah, mid-back injury, there's something, you know, and, um, and in the, those days we didn't have so much MRI and we didn't have so many CT scans. And so there's sort of, you know, the, the whole aspect between a sort of a bony injury versus a stress injury versus a stress fracture that, that sort of subtlety of diagnosis didn't really exist. It was much more of a, but anyway, we requested, I requested getting imaging on her and it was a, yeah, stress reaction, which of course, you know, it was a stress factor actually. So that was obviously quite devastating for her because it meant that she wasn't going to be able to complete yeah, what she wanted to do in terms of her training and all the other bits and pieces. But, yeah. uh, and then we had to decide whether she was going to risk, yeah, rowing yeah, in, the, in the final, or whether she wasn't going to risk it and, um, and that kind of thing. So that was all, so those are those are my sort of you know three stories of you know um how it was in the olympics and i'll tell you a, another story about in football and how football works so we had a we had one of the um one of the athletes one of the one of the one of the players um had a um uh quite an acute back and it was a friday and um, so they called me in. Normally I get, went in on a Thursday. And I didn't see him on the Thursday because he's busy. I was being quite protective about him and all that oh, sort of thing. So I got called in on the Friday. And um, it was basically, I look at, you know, so I looked at his back and everything else. And it was a bit, definitely a bit disky. And he had a bit of a sacroiliac, you know, problem on the, on the right side. And um, so I said, um, well, do you, want me to sort, do, you, do you want me to do my thing on this guy or, or not? What's the, what's the game plan? And they said, well, do what you can today. And then talk to the manager yeah, about what you think is going to happen with the player. So I said, fine. So I went in and I sorted him out as best I could and everything else. And then the, um, um, and then the, um, then I, w I turned up to the game on the Saturday. It was a home game. I turned up to the game on the Saturday. And the guy was running up and down, warming up. And um, so I said to the doc, I said, um, hang on a minute. You know, um, he, um, I said, he can't play tomorrow, but he can play for the Champions League game on Wednesday. So why is he why is he warming up? That's what I said to the manager, and the manager turned around and um, did it. the manager was busy with the game and his head was all over the place and all of that sort of thing. Anyway, the pair went on, and then of course his back went, and um, so you know went into spasm and everything else, and um, so uh, of course then I got hauled. So then I'm on the phone yeah to the you know where did we get to sort it out? So then I'm on the phone to the doc after the game, and he goes um, how why the hell did you you know blah blah blah? And I said uh, look. I was very specific. I said, you know, the guy can't play yet till Wednesday, um, Champions League game. I said, he shouldn't play today. You, it was your call. Manager knew what, what I said. It's all in his notes. You know, he shouldn't be playing today. The player knew he shouldn't be playing today and all the other bits and pieces. Anyway, he cut along with the manager, really wanted him to play on the Saturday. He wasn't quite so bothered about the Champions League game, yeah, because oh, okay. he, he wasn't in there. And so it wasn't really my fault, but it was extremely stressful. And then I had to, you know, and then I had to try and explain to the doctor why you know, he had relapsed, even though he was so much better on the Saturday morning. I said, well, because, you know, he's got an annular tear and so he's very unstable. So, of course, you know, he needed three or four days just to allow all that to settle down. He probably needed another treatment. So by doing everything too quickly, his body's going to go into spasm to protect itself and all of that kind of thing. And um, so even, if, even when you try really hard to do the right thing, you're as inclusive as you can, that sort of thing, often you're not aware of all of the other issues that are going on. And so yeah, sometimes, right. you know, you feel like you've messed up when you haven't. Actually, you've done your bit. And, uh, but it was, um, but yeah, it was, um, it was a, uh, so it was, um, and, then you, and then there are other, there are other moments I've had. It's like, I'm 
but walking into the Champions League final, and it was um, us again. It was Chelsea versus Man, Man United, and, and we were in Moscow, and it was a very exciting occasion. But as we walked into the as we walked into the stadium, and you know, all the blue flags of Chelsea were waving, and that sort of thing, we walked in, and all the Man United fans in front of us just all together put up these red, and it was all there was was in the middle of it was a was the was the cup, and it was just perfect. Every single Man United fan there did that, and they were completely motionless. And all the, all the Chelsea fans were going nuts. And I remember walking to the stadium, I went, if this is a close game, we all lose. And that's exactly what happened. I just knew it as we walked into the stadium because of the buzz in the room. And then, funnily enough, and then Chelsea were, in, were playing Bayern Munich. Yeah. Um, and and, I, and at, at that occasion, I knew we were going to win. It was really odd, very odd. It's a, like a premonition. I was now. I've never expected that because sport. You know, one of the things about sport is, is it's so, it's so. Um, I've never really shared that actually. I don't know why I'm telling you that now, but it was. But, but I just remember it was just one of those. It was one of those things. But these big occasions when you go and do these things, you never know quite what you're going to get out of it. Yeah. And yeah. The, sad thing about the, the sad thing about the, the Moscow one was that the boss of the club, the owner of the club, had a massive nightclub in in Moscow, and yeah. after and we'd won it. He was going to open that up to us and, um, and, and all the staff and all the players and everything else. We, we, we were. And of course, because we lost, he just turned around and said, everyone go home. And so we oh, never, wow. I never got to experience, you know, a billionaire's, you know, nightclub, oh, in, yeah. sadly. But, um, but uh, anyway, it was, um, oh, and then another, another funny thing about that story was, and so I got home and it was about six o'clock in the morning. I thought, I'm going to go for a run, yeah, before I just need to clear my head. I've had such a... I was crossing over this little bridge and um, I was in my full blown Chelsea kick because I literally just got off the plane, you know, yeah, just, yeah. you know, got off the taxi home, still in one. And, um, and this guy just came across and he went, loser. <laughs> <laughs> I, almost wanted, I almost wanted to kill him. Yeah, exactly. It was just one of those things. I just thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite, quite funny, you know, you mentioned that, like, that you knew the outcome and all that kind of, you know, you just had that sensation. And, you know, it's, it's not unheard of, not in the least, you know, we, 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 we get those premonitions, you know, if you want to call it that or whatever, but yeah, we get those things. Sometimes with the patient, sometimes with, you know, yeah. other things and you just kind of know already, as soon as you meet a person, you know, okay, this person is going to be fine or, or whatnot. And uh, yeah, I kind of call it my bump of trouble, you know, it's just there. If, uh, if that itches, I know it's going to be a tricky one. Yeah, I know, and, and it is funny how you know your brain works sometimes, and you just get these sort of premonitions and uh, mm. that sort of thing. But anyway, that's uh, so. We, I think we have to, we have to have positive thoughts and think that you know, it's, you know. Oh, absolutely, absolutely right. You know, it's I suppose somebody somebody once told me you know that there's there's two kinds of people in the world. You know, there's there's those people who um for whom life is easy, you know, yeah. waltz and dance from one success to another. And there's never anything is too nothing is too much trouble, and um, you know they're the lucky ones, and then of course there's the unlucky ones for whom life is a struggle and everything is misery and 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 you know things don't go right and so forth. Uh, but the actual difference is nothing to do with luck; it's to do with focus. Yeah. You know the first group of people they focus on what they want, and the second group focuses on what they don't want. Yeah. And it just leads to one thing leads to another almost. That's exactly it. Yeah. No, absolutely right. But you know what? Thank you for sharing those stories. Those were actually absolutely brilliant. You know, I thought <laughs> it was going to be all rib stories, but uh, no, <laughs> then we got other stuff as well. But uh, you know, in terms of the, um, you know, like like the footballer and that, you know, with the disc blowing up and all that. I mean, okay, there's nothing you could have done differently, obviously. Um, apart from maybe duct taping him to the bench and not letting him go anywhere <laughs> is frowned upon these days. Yeah. But uh, at the end of the day, you know, because I suppose the managers and medics, they don't quite understand it. No. You, know, you explain it very clearly. Yeah. You're like, well, he's better. So it yeah. must be better. Yeah. No, that's exactly. And I think sometimes we underestimate our expertise. You know, because the thing is, is what we what we what we treat as being normal, and you know, our ability to assess an injury, work out how quickly, and all of that stuff is going on. You're thinking to yourself, okay, this needs 48 hours, this needs 72 hours, and all of that sort of thing. And I think because we spend a lot of our time working by ourselves, yeah, yes, you may communicate that to your patient, but you're not used to communicating it to other external people 
in a language that they understand. And it goes back to what you said about doing that FIFA course. You understand now how sports medicine yeah, talks. I right. had another case whereby the player, we had a very, very difficult um, disc injury on this player. The player wasn't particularly compliant in terms of his rehab and, and all of that sort of thing. And he just kept, he kept breaking down. And um, so we had this conversation, you know, so, so the doc called everybody in and said, right, what are we going to do about this? What are we going to do about this player? And then we all sat there and I basically just said, um, you know, basically these are his options. Yeah, this is da-da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, he can have surgery, he can do da 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 he's got to comply and all those sort of things. I think but he has been, his compliance is poor, so I don't think that's going to change. And I just went through this whole plethora of options he had. And at the end of it, the doc went to the rest of the medical team. Okay, anyone else got any, anyone else got any thoughts? And no one in the team commented. No one, no one in the rest of the medical team. There's 16 people in the medical team said anything. Wow. And um, so the doc went, okay. So the doc then went and rang the two top um, spinal surgeons in London and sort of said, um, do you agree yeah, with what the um, outcome of this, you know, what, what, all the things outside. He didn't tell any of this to me on my face. Yeah? He just disappeared and um, all that sort of thing. And he came back and he said, right, Tom, we're going to run with your, yeah, your plan. Uh, because I was recommending a microdiscectomy at that point, because I said this is going to be the quickest way for him to stabilise, bearing in mind his compliance is poor and all of that sort of thing. And um, everything I'd said, fortunately, the surgeons had agreed with. Yeah. So, you know, which gave me, gave me lots of credibility, which was really nice. And um, so, um, but it, for, for me and for you, that's just normal, you know, chiropractic language. You know, you just go through that's the options and all that sort of thing. But... I was genuinely quite shocked at how little understanding they had. Yeah, even the you know the the, the, the the medics there had of backs and the subtleties of backs and how you know is that what it happened to be? But it's the same with you know. Um, and then another another story I had was this guy kept getting a recurring right hamstring problem. Yeah. Yeah. I said I said, I said it's the way he kicked. You know. So anyway, anyway, and he'd been to see the rest of the medical team. He wasn't very keen on seeing me because he didn't. He was like, oh, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be clicked. I've seen Tom do that to other people and everything else. And he was getting more desperate. So he finally came up to me and said, um, right, Tom, I want you to have a look. So, so I went through the whole, and his kinematic chain was basically, as he kicks with his right foot, he was bringing his left, his right arm back again. So he was pinching yeah, the whole of his back oh, as he was doing yeah, it. Yeah, I see. Yeah. And um, so I went through this whole protocol with him. I said, this is what you're doing and everything else. And so this is what we're going to try and do to address that. And I gave him a program of things to do. Put it all in his notes. The next week I went back in again. And because um, I've been away on holiday, I went back in the next week. And, um, and the doc starts and I'm going, yeah, we got the player in and we got the, the Arsenal osteopath yeah, to come in and have a look at him. And he turned around and said, basically, the way he kicks, he brings his arm back. And I'm sitting there in the meeting going, hang on a minute. This is just what... I, but I flagged this up before I went away. So yeah. what discussion now? And the doc looks at everybody in the medical team and goes, hang on a minute. So why did he see the, the, the French osteopath in the first place? And why is no one listening to what Tom's saying? And the reason for it was, is one of the physios is French. He's good mates with the, with the French uh, Arsenal osteopath. Hadn't bothered reading my notes. I hadn't caught him at the end of the day because he had already gone home, yeah, by which time it was. So he, I just texted him and said, read my notes, yeah? And you'll, you'll see what's going on. And of course he hadn't done any of that. But that's just normal protocol. And that's, you know. Well, that's what happens, isn't it? Yeah. But at least, I, at least, at least, at least, you know, more than one of us agreed. Yeah, quite. Yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, what, what I suppose what that story beautifully illustrates, you know, is that the very chiropractic way of looking at a, a, a whole player, not just the hamstring. Yeah. You know, you spend your, your days doing cross friction massage on the hamstring and trying to do a bit of PIR and PNF and whatever mm -hmm. else you know you do, but actually you know you start figuring out the ankle and the knee and the hip and the mm -hmm. shoulder and the whatnot and mm -hmm. and you know because it for us it makes biomechanical sense. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and that, and you know and, and um, it's and that's cool. That's, I love doing that stuff. Oh yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, that's, hey, what that's what we're so good at. That's what that's what makes the difference. Yeah, come on, ain't nothing better yeah. than finding a real puzzling case, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. When you can go and go, mm, I'm not sure what's going on, let's figure this out. Mm -hmm. No, I like those much better than the standard, you know, box standard things. <laughs> uh, that's exactly it. But I think you talk to anybody who's involved in sport, and they all they can all tell you these, you know, these, these stories of, you know. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And you know what, that's partially why we're doing this little, little chat show thing, you know, to, to get these kind of cool stories out for people and, 
you know, people can uh, listen and watch, our, watch us have a natter about talking shop to our heart's content, that kind of thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's something I, I, I personally enjoy these, these tremendously. And uh, yeah. it, it fires me up again to go to clinic tomorrow, even just us having a, having a chat on Zoom. Of course, it'd be better mm-hmm. over a pint, you know, sometimes, <laughs> next time. Next time, exactly, and once we get through uh, lockdown and everything else. But you know, I think Zoom's been a good, it's been a good, good tonic for all of us, hasn't it? Really, over that, over that time. Oh, it uh, most certainly has. Yeah. Good stuff. But well, hey, listen, you know what? Time is running, and I think it's all pretty much bedtime for me. Maybe. For okay. You. But uh, thank you, Tom. Thank you for share, uh, sharing the stories and being with us this evening uh, and giving us uh, donating your time. That's very kind of you. And, My pleasure. Uh, yeah, no, that's uh, that's absolutely been brilliant. brilliant. Yeah, good. I hope I hope to see it. I'm um, you know some of you guys at um, Fix Events in the future, and um, you know um, let's uh, get on with it and have some fun. All right. Absolutely. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Cheers then. Bye bye now. Bye for now. <laughs>